Spanning the nerd world and feeding your fandom. It's time for the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Here's your host, James Witham. How about a little history lesson for your holiday weekend? It's episode 369 of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. I'm James Witham. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully you're getting to enjoy it with friends and family, and thanks for taking the time to, hey, make me a part of that as well. Got a little history lesson for you, and a new movie coming out called The American Traitor, Trial of Axis Sally in theaters and on demand right now. So I'm going to talk to Meadow Williams and Sven Trimmel, who play Mildred Gillers and Billy Owen, respectively, in the movie. So a very interesting dynamic between the two of them in the movie as well. And you want to talk about a World War II story you might not know a whole lot about? This is one that will really pique your interest. Plus, no comic reviews this week because there's so many things to talk about in the world of entertainment. We're going to talk about Cruella, Lucifer, Panic, give my spoiler-free review of all those. And there's some major nerd news this week. We're going to talk about the story with Amazon and MGM and a heck of a lot more as well. But And hey, guess what? HelloFresh back as our sponsor this week. You want 12 free meals and good ones? Like really good stuff? Yeah. A little bit later on, I'll tell you how I can hook you up with that. But first, let's head to the movies and talk American Trader, The Trial of Axis Sally with Meta Williams and Swen Temmel up next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hi, this is Griffin Newman from The Tick, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. So we're going to dive into another little piece of history, and it's called American Trader, The Trial of Axis Sally, another World War II story that you might not know too well. And we just happen to have Mildred Gillers herself, Meta Williams, and Swen Trummel, who plays Billy Owen. How's it going? Good. How are you? We're excited to be on board. Thanks for having us. Well, I'm doing great. Now, you know, we've all learned about World War II at some point in school. How interesting was it for the both of you to kind of tell this particular story of Mildred Gillers that most people might not even know about? <laughs> it, it was it was great. Mildred was a very complex person, and she lived through a lot more than most people ever even think about going through. And it was really, really intense being across from Al Pacino working with Thomas. It was just wonderful. And she was a woman whose story needed to be told. Yeah, I mean, these these characters, they're all real life people. And like you said, it's a World War II story that not a lot of people have heard about or if heard about at all in their history books or in passing or whatever. So we're both very excited to be able to tell this story about this incredible woman who lived through hell and came out on the other end kind of just bruised instead of, you know, hung. hung. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely a good way to put it. (laughs) Exactly. And working with such a legend like Al Pacino was just one of the greatest experiences that Anyone anyone could have. And that's something that I'll treasure for the rest of my life. I really hope that people enjoy our movie and get to learn a little bit about Mildred Gillers. We'll get to Al Pacino in just a second for sure. But Meadow, on the surface, things really look bad for Mildred when we get started. And and even the trailer, they they say, you know, she's the most hated person in America at the the time. How did your opinion of her change, though, from when you first got the role to when filming was over? I knew Mildred uh, and Mildred knew me. It was it was a you know, there's a special bond between an actor and their character, especially when it's a true life character. And Mildred was a phenomenal, deep complex and very, very strong woman. She was a powerhouse within herself and she came from nothing and created a whole life, a a, a new life in another country. And she also created this character on the radio that people listen to like you. And you know how that is, but imagine a time when women didn't do that and uh, no one else was really doing it that much, you know? So there were very few women that were strong to, for people to look to. So she was a, a woman that was a, a real, she did things no one did. She set up- um, A pioneer. Yeah. That's an innovator, person. you could even say. An innovator, yeah, innovator. Yeah. An innovator, a pioneer, but she was also a woman that was being- sexually harassed, uh, sexually abused, physically abused, and tormented by her bosses, her employers. So she was the first Me Too. She's also a woman that understood being a woman. So she was strong, yet she was also glamorous, which is very, very important. You know, I I think that's a, a balance that's 
really special when someone can strike that, when they can be glamorous and fully embrace womanhood and yet be strong and be powerful and, and try to get you know, your work done without letting all the horrible things around you bring you down too much. I mean, my goodness, this woman, she was in the middle of a war zone and trying to carry on her business and trying to put up with her beyond abusive bosses. I, you know, they were taking people out and shooting them while, while work was going on. So if someone in, in their working environment, one of the musicians or one of the other people misbehaved, they would take them out and shoot them. So she was dealing with the fact that at any time she could be snatched up by the hair and drug out and shot. And that's a lot to live with. And she was also dealing with her sweetheart was dying at one point, and she was dealing with his slow decline, and she was dealing with a lot. But it, it's an intense, beautiful, scary, horrible, fabulous story that needed to be told the correct way for history, because history was not fair to this woman. It was a time when they were looking for a scapegoat. You'll see. You'll, you'll make up your own mind. But there's definitely a story that was not told. And you can decide if you think she was a traitor or you think she was a woman in a horrible position or both. You know, you can you can decide for yourself. One you of the see. things I love about the film, actually, that's that's you you kind of touched right on that, actually. I want to talk about I don't obviously don't want to spoil anything, but I do want to talk about a, a scene that stuck out to me while I was watching the film. It's when Mildred walks into the courtroom for the first time and it's the way that Billy looked at her and the way she kind of just walks in with this swagger, right? So there was a real spark of chemistry there like immediately. So talk about that scene a little bit and how it sets the stage for their interactions throughout the film. Well, it's sort of, she is the biggest thing in America at this very moment. So for this young guy who just got this job from Laughlin and his first time in a courtroom in the biggest case in America, it's sort of like being on the street and running into Al Pacino. It's, she was the biggest star of that time. And newspapers, radios, they all covered her. Then everybody knew who this woman was. So it was like, it was a, a moment of starstruck for Billy. And, you know, that was just the beginning of their relationship. And that's where it started. And then, you know, as the movie progressed, you'll see that there's a beautiful story that's told between Mildred and Billy and their relationship really goes to a whole nother level. And I do feel that Billy had a big part to do with Mildred Giller's uh, sentencing in the end. So it was a, an honor for me to play Billy because the book and then the screenplay was written by my character, by Billy Owen. So the accounts and everything that are told in this story come from Billy. So for me, it was a pleasure and I hope that I did him justice and I hope that he's looking down from up above and saying he did it right. So it was a, a fun character to play and that moment was the beginning of it all. Yeah, I don't think you have to worry about that one bit. I thought you did a fantastic job. But that, that, of course, that's just me. And and for, for, for you and for you, Meadow. I mean, it, what you had to do in this film, I thought was was crazy because I mean, one minute you're 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 singing, and then another minute you're in a jail cell fighting for your life. So, did it almost feel like you were kind of playing two different characters at times, Axis Sally and Mildred Gillers? Yes, absolutely. I've heard people say that sometimes uh, actors' lives can be a little schizophrenic. <laughs> and there is something to be said for that. You are living these very different lives. And, and she, the woman she was that was being oppressed and, and being mistreated and, and also performing versus the woman she was once everyone decided that, you know, she was horrible and, and needed to be on trial and there was a lot of hate sent her way. And, and then some people still loved the, the character they had heard on the radio. So there was a lot of complex things. And, and the thought of a woman just being stuck in a jail by herself, away from everyone, you know, she saw no one. The way they had her kept in confinement was really, really pretty brutal. And she couldn't react to anyone. So that was a very lonely place. And going where she was was very, very painful. I always choose my acting roles very carefully. 
because you know you have to live it. You're going to be living that person's mm -hmm. life. But with Mildred, I felt like it was such an injustice that her story had not been told, that I had to, to take it and I had to go. Um, and yes, this is a very special role for a woman, but it's also a very painful role to live. But Mildred was worth it. And, and her story needed to be told. And thank you to Vance Owen for writing your father's screenplay, taking your father's book about the real man, Billy, and what he lived through uh, watching all of this. I, I love that it's a firsthand story. You know, his father was involved with the, the making until he died before the film actually started filming, but he was involved up till then. He was a very special man and, and uh, we salute him for putting all this on paper and, and giving it to the world. Absolutely. Just incredible. You were, you were both talking about Al Pacino a little bit earlier and he, and he was amazing. I, I don't know what it is about Al Pacino inside a courtroom. But there's just something there that's just so captivating. But, but Swan, I have to ask you specifically, what's it like to kind of be yelled at by Al Pacino in classic Al Pacino fashion? Because Billy really gets lit up in this movie at one point. He gets, I mean, between the thing in the courtroom where he uh, insults me, then he insults me in the office. You know, it's, if you're going to get yelled at by somebody in this world, and if somebody's going to abuse, verbally abuse you, it's got to be Al Pacino. No doubt. And uh, for me to get yelled at by him, it was sort of like the best thing that could have happened. And that scene in uh, the office where, you know, there's that heated conversation, that was sort of a, a build. And some of those lines weren't originally in the script. And that kind of just developed into what it is that you see in the movie now. So I, I did try to egg him on a little bit and uh, bring some of that out, but it was, it was a great, I love that scene so much. And it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. It was, I mean, yeah, like I said, getting yelled at by Al Pacino any day of the week. Yeah, I hear that. Before I let you both go, of course, you know, Memorial Day weekend's coming up here in the United States, which typically means a lot of big movie releases, which is yours is going to be one of them. So how do you, do you feel like this is kind of the perfect weekend to be to be showing this movie? Well, it is it is a, a memorial. I mean, memorial. It's in the, it's in the title. And this is a movie about you know, a memory, a history, a, a, a time to think back and a time to reflect. And I think that's the beauty of it, to, to celebrate our history and learn from it. And, and I think Memorial Day weekend is perfect. Yeah, I think it couldn't be a better time for this movie to come out, for people and to Al learn. Pacino, American legend on Memorial Day. It's perfect. There couldn't be a better time. So we're very proud of this film. We put a lot of hard work into this film, a lot of dedication. And I hope that people get to learn a thing or two about something of the past, a little history lesson, but also not in a boring way, in an interesting way that they'll pay attention and take a few things away from it. In a very interesting way. And you guys will see it this coming Friday, May the 28th. That's when American Trader, The Trial of Axis Sally can be shown in select theaters and on demand as well. And like Meadow said earlier, you can see it, you can make up your own mind about Mildred Gillers. It's Meadow and Sven. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Thank you very much. It was a true pleasure to be part of your show. Down Nerdy Podcast, go! <laughs> <laughs> this really is one of those stories that you're going to be able to make up your own mind. You're going to see a piece of World War II history that you might not know. And just know that this story comes from one of the guys that was in the courtroom, like Sven said, which is incredible. I love that firsthand account. So America Trader, The Trial of Axis Sally, in select theaters now. And on demand. And yeah, Al Pacino, you can't go wrong. You definitely don't want to miss this one. That's going to do it for my conversation with Meta Williams and Swim Trimble about American Trader, The Trial of Axis Sally. Up next, it's time to talk about Cruella, my spoiler-free review of the Disney films. Up next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Luke Mitchell from Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And you are listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. It is time to get mean in my spoiler-free review of Disney's Cruella. Again, since the movie just dropped, I got to see it early, but I'm going to give this spoiler-free review. I have some thoughts that I'm going to be sharing on social media throughout the week, though, that might be a little bit spoilery, spoilery, so make sure you're keeping your eye on that. I also got to participate in the Cruella press conference before the movie aired, so I'll be sharing some stuff from that here as well. Won't be able to share the audio with you. Not allowed to use the audio, but I will be able to kind of reveal some stuff for you as I do this review. But before I get started doing that, just my overall thoughts are that this might be 
one of the best prequel type movies that I've ever seen. And, and I say that with with all honesty, because the, the way that they put this story together, I thought was incredible. I thought the way that they go from, again, and this might be the only spoiler I'll give you, but I'm pretty sure it's in the trailer, so it's not really a spoiler. We start out with Cruella as Estella. That, that's her name, is, is, is Estella. And we get to see how she becomes, eventually becomes, Cruella de Vil. So the way that you see that transition go is really, really interesting to me and see how she's, quite frankly, driven to that point, right? Now, does that excuse her wanting to kill 100, 101 puppies later on in her life? No, absolutely not. But I'm just saying how she ends up becoming Cruella and how she's pushed to that point and who she's pushed by, I think, makes things very, very interesting and of course, Emma Stone, fantastic. Just so she is so good as the in this role as Estella and Cruella, and the way that she has to dance between these two characters, I think is great. Emma Thompson as the Baroness is just off the charts amazing. The dogs in this movie are fantastic. I'll get to that here in just a second. But the one thing that you, that kind of should not go unnoticed about this movie either is just the massive, and I mean massive, set designs that they have in this thing. As a matter of fact, during the press conference when Fiona Crombie, production designer, was talking about this, she said that there were 120-odd sets to do across the course of the shoot. That, to me, is unbelievable. And some of these sets, once you see them, especially like these party scenes and stuff like that, are massive in scale. And she talks about how in future projects, she's like, oh, I'm not busy enough. What happened? And then she remembers, oh, that's right. I worked on Cruella. And that was a theme throughout the press conference. Everybody talking about how, you know, things aren't as huge in their future projects as they have been on Cruella. And that just tells you the kind of scale that they had to work, had to work on. So to me, that just tells you all you need to know about the attention to detail that they brought to this movie, right? The, the fact that they really brought this punk rock scene of London to life and the way that they crafted the music in there I thought was really, really great. And just, the st- again, the style in general. You, you know, you don't have to be like a, appreciate high fashion to be able to appreciate the designs that were a part of this movie, quite frankly, especially the, the looks for Cruella and the Baroness. And, I mean, quite frankly, everybody across the board really, really looked the part. And... The way that they use these outfits to transform, and, and the wigs, and to, to, as a matter of fact, to transform from Estella to Cruella. It's almost like, you know how like professional wrestlers say, you know, like when you walk through that curtain, that's when the shift happens. That's when you come in to your character. You can almost see Emma Stone become Cruella when she walks out with that first Cruella outfit, which you've seen in the trailer, by the way. When she walks into that room for the first time as Cruella, you see that shift when she puts that on, right? And any time she puts that Cruella persona on, you can see the shift from Estella to Cruella. And you almost can see those lines start to blur a little bit more as the movie plays out, too, which I found super, super interesting in how this thing was going. But, of course, you know, dogs are also a part of this movie as well. As a matter of fact, I asked... Greg, Craig Gillespie, who's the director, during the press conference, I get to ask him a question, and, and I asked that it was no surprise that dogs were part of the film, but I wanted to know how he wanted to incorporate them, not just to be true to Corella's story, but also give insight into her past. And he was talking about wanting to bring them more in more in a grounded way, which actually, once you watch the movie, will make perfect sense. He said, we worked on a story a lot with the role of the Dalmatians and her relationship to them, which become actually a plot device in this story, by the way, and part of her emotional journey, quite frankly, which emotional journey were his, were his words, not mine. And the fact that she has dogs that are a part of her crew, Estella does, with, with Jasper and Horace. So you get to see, and by the way, Wink was, stole the show, I'm sorry. Wink was, Wink, Wink was one of the biggest stars of this movie. I, I don't care who's on the byline or anything like that. Yeah, Wink was a huge star in this movie. Wait till you see Wink when you watch Cruella. But in those fun moments, there is also some, there are also some very dark moments. We're still talking about a villain here. As a matter of fact, Emma Stone, when she was talking during the press conference, talked about how she was surprised and how dark this movie really was. And then and that she said basically it's definitely dark 
for a Disney movie. But then on playing actually Estella and Cruella, I think I thought it was interesting how Emma Stone at the press conference talked about how there was something about Cruella that's enticing. And I love the way that she used the word enticing when she talked about Cruella, but also the rejection that she said, there's a sort of rejection of Estella that comes at a point where she thinks Estella is sweet, but at the same time, she's not fully embodied. So I thought that was a very interesting way to describe the two different parts of this character, quite frankly. And you see that, play out throughout the movie, which I think is amazing. And you get to see, again, how she gets to that point and what she's willing to do and lines that she's willing to eventually start crossing, right? And maybe, and it's weird because, again, this is this character we're talking about who kills who kills puppies or wants to kill puppies. And, you know, we're not down for that. You know, nobody's down for killing puppies. But, you know, you find yourself almost, I certainly did, find myself sympathizing with her at certain points as a Stella and you go, wow, look at all the shit that she's been through basically for lack of a better way of putting it. And then you, and then you see how things sort of the way that they entwine the ending of this movie and, and, and unravel it is fantastic. By the way, the, the way that it plays out and how this plan comes together is just incredible to me. And again, I can't spoil a one single second of this ending but it's fantastic. I mean, and you want to talk about an ending that makes sense for a prequel and knowing where things are going to go. Yeah, I, incredible the way that they crafted this ending. But you want to talk about villains. Let's talk about the Baroness for a second. Let's talk about Emma Thompson, who, by the way, is way more hilarious than I expected. Quite frankly, I had no idea how hilarious Emma Thompson was until we went to this press conference and got to spend a little time with her. But she also talked about not just at the press conference, she talked about not just being able to play a villain, but she said exploring the dark side of a female character because so rarely are female characters allowed to be dark. And she talks about how single-minded that the Baroness is and how she's kind of hardened in a way and, and that that's just who she is and she will not deviate from that at all and how she's basically so committed to herself and her own creativity and she's unable to kind of almost unable to see anything else and quite frankly if I mean if you're asking me you could make the argument that the Baroness is more evil than Cruella de Vil will eventually become and that's saying a lot. So you want to talk about how evil the Baroness is and how much you're probably going to dislike this character? Yeah, I think it's right up there. I know you might be thinking I'm overstating this, but uh, uh, trust me, I am not. Wait, wait till you see it for yourself. I also really love that dynamic between Estella and Jasper and Horace. It's just, you know, they're the kind of crew you root for, right? And, qu quite frankly. And there's one character, though, that I think is going to get a lot of chatter on social media, and I think fans are going to love, and that is Artie, who's played by John McRae. Just wait till you see Artie. This is one of those characters that I think that you're really, really going to fall in love with, and just talk about, you know, quotable moments, you know, gifable moments, memeable moments. Yeah, that is Artie to a T in Cruella. I, the only character I wish we could have really seen more of was Anita Darling, who's played by Kirby Hal Baptiste, and I'll be talking about her again a little bit later on in the show for something else that she's been cast in. But I, I think we could have seen her more. Y you kind of see something that plays out towards the end with her that kind of teases that maybe we're going to see more from her. So that's the only thing that I think I would have done differently. But, I mean, as far as direction goes, Craig Gillespie, fantastic job. What a clever screenplay that was written by Dana Fox, Tony McNamara, and, and, and Elaine ba Brosh McKenna, who d was part of the story as well. Just, I mean, this was not going to be an easy movie to craft, I don't think. And especially to, to gain sympathy for, for a villain that I think a lot of us have hated over the years for obvious reasons. But they found a way to do that and tell a story that was interesting, that made sense for where the character is going to go later on in her life. And quite frankly, I think kind of leaves the door open. A little bit to maybe do another one, if, you, if, you're, if you're giving me my honest opinion. And if you want to know if there's a post credit scene, yes, there is a post credit scene. I won't say absolutely anything about it, but it's very clever. It makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, don't rush out. If you're seeing this in the theaters, don't rush out when the credits start rolling. Stick around a little bit. If you're watching this on Disney Plus with Premiere Access, make sure you're sticking around 
about halfway through the credits, I think, is where the scene is. So it's more of a mid credit scene. But yeah, it's important, and it's something that you're definitely going to want to see. But I enjoyed Cruella incredibly. I almost never have time to watch movies for a second time unless my kids want to watch it over and over and over again. And so, but this is one that I will definitely sneak away and find time to watch again. So make sure you check out Disney's Cruella, whether it's in theaters or with Disney Plus Premier Access. This is one that was wicked fun, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. This week, the Down and Nerdy podcast is brought to you by HelloFresh. And I've actually been switching between HelloFresh and Green Chef. uh, HelloFresh owns Green Chef, by the way. I love the variety to choose from, from both plans. They actually suit suit different needs, even for different days of the week, too. So, I mean, you've got your chance to try both, thanks to us. So, make sure you go ahead and try both. But if you're looking at HelloFresh, it really cuts out the stress of meal planning and grocery shopping. You can actually enjoy cooking dinner again because it's on the table in about 30 minutes or less. As a matter of fact, we made the San Antonio burrito bowls from HelloFresh. If those are ever on the menu again, jump on that. I have never tried blue corn chips in my life because I thought, ah, blue corn chips. Why would anybody do that? Do it, especially if it's through HelloFresh because it was amazing. I mean, you got the ground beef. You got the rice. I had a little extra cheese because I like a little extra cheese. They provided so much cheese that we had a chance to throw extra on there as well. So I really love that. And there's really just a wide variety of easy, delicious options for all three meals a day, plus even a snack, an espresso treat in between as well. So you really get everything with HelloFresh. And you want to try 12 free meals on us. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Nerdy12 and use code Nerdy12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. How about that? So you go to HelloFresh.com slash Nerdy12 nerdy the number 12 and use code nerdy the number 12 and you get 12 free meals and it's all good stuff it's pre-portioned you're really going to enjoy it. if you've got somebody in your life you love cooking dinner with this is a chance to get in there as a family or as a couple and cook dinner together because it's quick it's easy and you spend more time enjoying your life instead of being stuck in the kitchen so get your 12 free meals now HelloFresh.com slash Nerdy12 and code Nerdy12 to try HelloFresh because, quite honestly, you're going to wonder why it took you so long. That's going to do it for my spoiler-free review of Cruella. Up next, we're going to be talking about Lucifer Season 5B. Let's get into all the wickedness next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hello, this is Tom Ellis from Lucifer, and you are listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Oh, my dad. The moment we've been waiting for is finally here. It's Season 5B, as we're calling it. Of Lucifer has arrived on Netflix since it just arrived. And of course, these podcasts come out on Friday. Going to do this one spoiler free. So not going to reveal anything other than the fact that, you know, from last season, the Dennis Haysbert's God does make an appearance at the on the on the finale, the midseason finale of the season and is very much a part of the second half of this fifth season not much i can tell you for sure so you're going to get a lot of dennis haysbert and a lot of him interacting with a lot of the different characters not just the family but pretty much every character on the show gets to have their moment with big guy whether they know it or not so but what something that happens with god is a central part of the second half of this season and pretty much where the conflict comes in. Now, obviously, when you bring in a character like this that's been talked about since the beginning of the show and is the reason for, well, Lucifer thinks is the reason for a lot of his problems and a lot of the issues in general. And I think that everybody at some point has questioned God at some point during this show, right? So you bring a character like that in. Of course, the first couple of episodes are going to be kind of unpacking that, right? And the show actually does that very, very well without laser like focusing on specific things, it really does touch on a little bit of everything when it comes to questions that the the characters have had and that we've had by extension are maybe not necessarily fully answered but are addressed, right? So that's the best way I can really describe it without actually spoiling anything, which I'm not going to do. But you get that great tension between Lucifer and his dad. You get that, you know, how, how you feel like a men deal would react to having dad on earth. You you get that. And Michael is very much in the mix of this as well. And it's funny to watch their dynamics, the, the brothers, watch their dynamics, not just around their father, but how their dynamics kind of shift once their father is present. 
you know, who's the same, who's a little bit different, who's clearly changing up their persona. Now the dads here. I think that that's a really, really interesting part of this as well. And some other reactions to God's character are very, very interesting. I don't want to tell you who knows and who doesn't. Okay, so I don't want to. I don't want to go there, but it's interesting to see certain react. Well, there is one that I will kind of reveal for you. So a little bit of a minor spoiler here because I I have to talk about this because I think this is one of the funniest things about this second part of season five, and that is the interactions between Dennis Haysbert's character of God and Kevin Alejandro's character of Dan for obvious reasons right you know the whole charlotte thing and who she was anyway there there's some moments between the two of them just and they're not long scenes they're quick scenes and i love how they play out it is so hilarious how that whole thing works As a matter of fact kevin alejandro has a great episode in the second half of the season where, where the where you get dan as a very central figure of the episode and i absolutely Loved that episode, too. But just that those scenes were so funny. And there's a lot of funny moments in this season. That was definitely one of them. But if you if you want to talk about revelations, I mean, there's a lot of God bombs in this in this second half of season five where where God reveals a lot of things or certain things that are brought up that you you weren't necessarily sure of. He kind of lets you know, hey, yeah, this is exactly how it is. And, yeah, you were either right about that or wrong about that. I And I love that they used, they almost used him as a tool in certain instances to be able to answer questions because, I mean, hey, who the, who better to ask and reveal that than the all-knowing, right? So, you know, why not? But what happens with this character later on in the second half of the fifth season is where things really get interesting and really changes the dynamics for everyone, quite frankly, whether they know it or not. And that also leads us up to what is eventually the end of season five, which I obviously am not even, I'm not even going to kind of try to spoil that because it's such an amazing ending. And I don't want to rob the Lucifer fans of that. So I'm not going to spoil it here in my review, but there's a couple of other things I like to put out, point out too, because I think that this, the way that they deal with the dynamic between Chloe and Lucifer and what's going on with them. And you understand that you will understand why the way the, the mid-season finale played out between Chloe and Lucifer, you under, you get to know why that played out the way it did. Or at least it gets explained, okay? So that much I can tell you. But the way that they weave through this dynamic between the two of them and where they are or where they aren't, I thought was done very, very well, and it wasn't dismissed quickly. It was actually allowed to play out throughout at least part of the season anyway. And, and it really, and you show how the, it shows how that took its toll. On these characters too, right? And, and and you get to see a little bit of a different Chloe Decker this year, I feel like, in in this particular part of the season. And you get to see Chloe maybe change things up from how she would normally deal with things before. And that's an interesting thing. It shows the evolution of that character. Not only credit to Lauren German, but also credit to the writing staff and Joe Henderson and Ildry Modrovich uh, of how they crafted this character and show how their characters can evolve even after five seasons. Right. So I, I thought that that was an incredible piece to be able to do that. And speaking of evolving, I mean, the way that things play out with Maze this season are incredible. And just what they've done with Maze in general and Leslie and Brant is, you know, deserves a huge amount of praise for that. And it, just the way that we see Maze this season is just fantastic. I will say that. So if you're waiting for a big maze payoff, you're going to get one in the second half of the fifth season, I can assure you. And speaking of speaking of maze, I'm sorry, but Maze and Ella stole the musical episode. I'm sorry. There were a lot of great performances in the musical episode. There was a lot of great singing, a lot of great dancing. But Amy Garcia and Leslie Ann Brandt stole that episode with their performance together i'm sorry that's where i'm at don't at me about that there were a lot of great ones that one was my favorite you know you i will never turn down tom ellis singing at a piano ever but that that was the best musical performance of all of them i'm just saying just saying between the singing and dancing it was fantastic and, and you get to see you know how how ella's dealing with what happened to her in the last part of season five too 
again, this is a show that is that does not shy away from letting everybody have their moment. Not only because everybody involved with the show knows how much we love this cast in general, right? But they also know that all of these characters have purpose in their own way, and they're all important and integral to the story. It's not just about Lucifer and Chloe. It's not just about Lucifer and Amenadiel. It's about this combination of characters and how they've been able to tell this story with everyone involved and making all of these different characters important in their own way that makes this show as good as it is. And the way that they craft their serious moments with their fun and funny moments, of which there are a ton of both, that's not a balancing act that's done easily. And I think that the writing staff, and again, Joe Henderson, Ildry Modrovich, deserve a huge amount of credit for how they balance that, especially in this second half of season five, because there is a, there are a lot of ups and downs when it comes to that. I'm not saying in the writing or, or anything like that. that. That's not, don't take that as me saying that as a criticism. What I'm saying is, is that you're going to get a lot of highs and you're going to get a lot of lows emotionally if you love these characters. And the way that's balanced out by this writing team and how the scripts play out and how the episodes play out are huge. And you get so, and you actually get multiple big moments in this second half of season five. And that is, again, a huge credit to everybody involved in this show. So I know we waited a long time for the second half of season five. Absolutely 100% worth it. If you haven't seen it yet, set aside a good chunk of time because you're going to want to binge watch this one. Season 5, the remaining episodes of Season 5 of Lucifer, now streaming on Netflix. That's going to do it for my spoiler-free review of Lucifer Season 5B. Up next, going to go to another streamer and talk about the new Amazon Studios series, Panic. Do a spoiler-free review of that next on the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Hey everyone, this is D.B. Woodside from Lucifer, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. When it comes to, the, to living in a small town, how bad do you want out? It's time to talk about Amazon's brand new series, Panic, which again just came out, so I don't want to spoil anything, so spoiler-free review coming at you. And quite frankly, I mean, if you're not sure what this series is about, it's basically about a game called Panic that these high, graduating high school seniors play and, you know, it's a big cash payout, and you get to, it, it's your ticket out of the town. Basically, this town of Carp, Texas. It's, it's a way to change your life and get out and, and, you know, live a better life than you think you would have if you stayed in the small town, right? And there's only one winner. So you get this dynamic between these group of teenagers, and you've got Heather Neal, who's played by Olivia Welch who you feel like is the one that's, you know, it's like she's one of the ones that's destined to get out, right? But then something happens with her. You've got Ray Hall, who's like your classic jock douchebag guy that everybody seems to hate, right? And then you've also got, you know, a, a group of friends, quite frankly. You've got Bishop, who's who's friends with Heather, maybe a little bit more than that, but I won't go, I won't get into that too much. And then you've also got Natalie, who the, the, that's their, that's the best friends group, right? It's Heather, Bishop. And Natalie, they kind of are do everything together or around each other all the time sort of thing. But you've also got the mysterious characters, too, like a Dodge Mason, who's played by Mike Faced, who does such a great job with this with that role, quite frankly. And you've got Shauna Kenny, who's like a flamboyant type character. There's just a bunch of different teenage characters and you get and, and there's so many different dynamics and personalities between these characters, which is true to life, right? Of, of any or sort of high school senior class, right? Not everybody's the same, even in a small town. So it's those, you know, different dynamics of these characters that I think is one of the things that makes this really interesting. And you get to see what, you know, their family lives are like too and maybe why they're making this decision to try and get out of get out of Dodge or in this case, Carp. So, but then the police get involved too because this game, Panic, is like a secret society type game, right? It's really... The, the the judges are, are like not known to anybody, right? So it's very secretive, but then the cash payout is supposedly worth it, right? But you've got to do these, you know, very dangerous things. Picture like, and I'm gonna say like a small town living of a Friday night lights with the with the dynamics of a of a Beverly Hills nine oh two one oh, but everybody has a death wish sort of thing, right? So you've got the and you've got the cops in the town. And you've got Sheriff James Cortez, well, Jimmy Cortez, what they call him, played by en- en- Enrique Murciano, 
and you get to find out exactly why it's so personal for him to find out what's going on with Panic and stop this. And, you know, maybe he's not necessarily completely on the up and up. Although I think there's one character you need to watch for in this show that, that might not necessarily go noticed right away. But Sergeant Christine Langley, who's played by Lee Eddy, keep an eye on her because, he, you know, it's one of those, she's one of those characters where, like, she's smart. They need to listen to her more. I like her a lot. That's one of those characters that might not necessarily stand out right away when, like, you see the trailer or something like that, or even in the first couple of episodes. But as you keep watching the show, and this is exactly what happened to me, I'm like, they need to watch her because she's really smart. So if the, if the cops have any chance, she, I think she's their chance. But that, that again, that's my, that's my th- thing. But you know, there's one thing that you can almost be guaranteed in a story like this is that when there's a life changing money on the line, you get to see certain things change as far as dynamics are concerned. You know, friends might not necessarily be as much of friends as they were. You get to see some shady backdoor deals. Maybe you get to see characters that you wouldn't think in a million years would team up or hook up, by the way. You see that start to happen. So there's these crazy, you know, just shifts in, I don't want to say power because it's the wrong word, but dynamics, I guess maybe is a better word of how these things play out. And I got to tell you that that makes for a nice little, a nice little twisty game. Plus once you figure out who one of the, or at least we think we know this is one of the judges. And this happens about halfway through in this first season, your first jaw drop moment's going to come around episode four or five. And you're going to go, you're kidding, right? No way. Such and such is a judge. No way. That person is a judge. And how are they involved and how were they able to keep this a secret? When you get to that first big reveal, that's when you really, I mean, the show is interesting, but that's when you really start to ramp up your interest and go, okay, if this person is who I, is doing what I think that they're doing, that makes things completely different. And you sort of find out, and this is kind of teased in the trailer too. So this is not spoiling anything. You get to find out that this game might not be as, you know, as, on the up and up, well, I don't want to say on the up and up because they're doing shady shit anyway. But and but what I'm trying to say is is that maybe the fix is in, maybe it's not sort of thing, right? There's more to what goes on with how get, things get decided in panic than you would think. And the things that they have to do for these challenges, again, it starts out simple, but it ramps up as things go. And, it's, and the what thing I love about the challenges that they pick, because this could get corny easy, right? You know, it could turn into corny horror movie easy, but this is not a horror show. It's a thriller. So that that I can get you right, that right out of the way. The thing I love about how they pick the challenges is this is how you could imagine something playing out in a small town, right? It's not an unrealistic th- places or things that they do in a small town. It's like, really? So that, that exists in a small town. How would they be able to do that? No, it's like how they pick the locations and what they do with the locations. It seems like that's something that, that a drunken teenage party would be doing on a Saturday night in a small town anyway. Right. So it's, it makes the, the, that much more real. And if you've ever lived in a small town or if you grew up in a small town, I feel like you're going to relate to some of the stuff that they do in this series, you know, without the, without the, you know, threat of actually almost dying from doing this stupid thing that you're doing, but the desperation and what it does to these kids is really, really palpable. And it could be almost relatable in a certain sense. And it's, and it almost makes you question, okay, how far would you go if you were in this situation? Or if you really thought you couldn't have a life outside of your small town and you really wanted to get out, how far would you go? And you get to see that envelope push and what certain people will do. And you're going to judge certain characters for the choices that they make and the things that they'll do. I yelled at my TV a couple of times when I was watching this show. So I think that, you know, and this is an all ages show too, by the way, I don't think this is technically like a young adult series. You can enjoy this as an adult and there's not too much, you know, teenage drama stuff that's going to make you roll your eyes and it's going to make you, it's going to turn you off from the show. You can watch and enjoy the show as an adult. Uh, Obviously I think young adults will enjoy it on a certain different level, but at the same time, there's there's enough there's enough story here and enough mystery that I think you could enjoy this as an adult. Was it perfect? No, there's some tropes there that I that I won't reveal here, and some of them are 
are kind of obvious. A couple of me, I kind of feel like if they didn't do it, it wouldn't make sense in the show. So especially when you're talking about small towns, there's just certain things that, that are going to be true regardless of the situation. And you're going to go ahead and go with that. But, but again, I think that this show was pretty well crafted, not perfect, but certainly well done. And I think certainly worthy of another season coming up. So we'll have to see how that goes. So make sure you're checking out panic for yourself on Amazon prime video this weekend. Let me know what you think. That's going to do it for my spoiler-free review of Panic from Amazon Prime Video. Up next, we're going to get right to the nerd news because there's some big stuff going on. I'm James Witham, and this is the Down and Nerdy Podcast. This is Christine Adams from Black Lightning, and you're listening to the Down and Nerdy Podcast. The lion's about to be in his prime once again. It's time for nerd news, and I think the biggest story of the week is another big acquisition. Story And it's Amazon buying MGM Studios for $8.45 billion. This was announced by Senior VP of Prime Video in Amazon Studios, Mike Hopkins, this week, saying that Amazon intends to, quote, preserve MGM's heritage and catalog of films. So that's one of the goals. And Jeff Bezos actually chimed in and said that Amazon will reimagine some of MGM's properties for the 21st century. So does that mean reboot Palooza? Does that mean some spinoffs? Does that mean things set in certain worlds? Who knows? But this means that Amazon now owns the rights to 007, the Rocky franchises. Also got to keep an eye on Tomb Raider, Robocop, Stargate, The Handmaiden's Tale. Yeah, the, the Hulu series Handmaiden's Tale. And Vikings, which is one I'm certainly keeping my eye on because I think Amazon loves that. And I think that's no... <laughs> that's no stretch. Now, if you're wondering, okay, does this mean that No Time to Die is going to go straight to Prime Video? Now, remember, this still has to get regulatory approval. Government needs to get involved in everything. And by the time that's done, I wouldn't say that No Time to Die. I think No Time to Die will be out before that happens. So I think that will actually be released beforehand. So I wouldn't say that that's going to go right to Prime Video. And I don't think Amazon would do that anyway. I think Amazon would release it for at least a short time. In, in theaters before going straight to Prime Video. So I, I wouldn't look for that necessarily. But here's the thing. This is a big deal. And and, and, and again, I know I didn't talk about the the, the, the Discovery Warner Media merger last week because there wasn't a whole lot out about it at the time. But this one's had a couple of days to permeate now. And I think that this is something Amazon's been waiting to do for a long time, to vastly, and I mean vastly, expand their amount of programming. That they have not just the catalog of stuff that I just mentioned, but also just the sheer number of properties that they've now acquired that they own and can actually create content for. I mean, like Tomb Raider alone, the stuff that you could do with that, the stuff that you could do with 007, the stuff that they're that they've already you know, they've been very much a fan of the Rocky movies because the, and, and the Creed movies because they've been all over Prime Video for years, right? But I could see them taking something like RoboCop and turning that into something on Prime Video, maybe maybe as a series this time around. I could see them taking Stargate to another level. I could also see the fact that this is the perfect time to acquire the James Bond franchise because this is, you know, Daniel Craig's last Bond movie. It's Bond 25. It seems like they're getting ready to usher in a new era of James Bond. So if you're Amazon Studios... This is a 100% perfect time to do this and find out exactly where you want to go. And as Jeff Bezos said, reimagine it for the 21st century. Plus, Amazon Studios tends to like to hang on to their property. So I wouldn't see them shopping MGM series or movies to other studios or other networks or something like that. Amazon wants to own their own stuff. They clearly made, made this acquisition to keep everything in house. So it's not like when, you know, Warner Warner Brothers will do deals with like Netflix and have a Warner Brothers series on Netflix instead of putting it on HBO or HBO Max, something like that. No, 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 no. Amazon I don't think is gonna do that. Amazon wants to keep their stuff in house. So I mean, now that they own hand the rights to Handmaid's Tale, you think it's gonna stay on Hulu? Probably not. Again, I know I have no knowledge of what whether or not this is gonna happen, but I can't imagine that it's gonna stay on Hulu and some of these other, I mean, there's plenty of other properties to, to consider here as well, but I think this is a big deal. The price tag's pretty high. 
It's going to take you a while to, to make that back or even come close to it. I think this is another death blow to the theatrical window. And I, I think that we're going to see a lot less movies staying in the theaters exclusively for a lot longer. And this is just going to be one more. This is just going to be one more example of that. And, and by the way, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Plus, Amazon has a pretty good track record with what they're doing with their properties, too. So I think that this is going to ultimately end up, be, end up being a good thing for MGM. I think it's going to put that name and that logo back on the map where it should be because MGM has a storied history. And anybody who loves movies knows that. And I think Amazon will absolutely try to do that justice. We'll have to see where that ends up. I want to actually switch gears to talk about something that J.J. Abrams said. And he talks about working in the Star Wars franchise. And he's talking to Collider. And he talks about the lack of planning. And I want to read a couple of quotes, actually, because I feel like it's important before I, I get into this. So he says, and I quote, I feel like what I've learned as a lesson a few times now, and it's something that's especially in the pandemic year working with the writers has become clear. The lesson is that you have to plan things as best you can, and you always need to be able to respond to unexpected to the unexpected. And the unexpected can come in all sorts of forms, and I do think that there's nothing more important than knowing where you're going. Okay, let that sink in for a second. Now here's the next quote. You just never really know, but having a plan I have learned, in some cases the hard way, is the most critical thinking because otherwise you don't know what you're setting up. You don't know what to emphasize because if you don't know the inevitable of the story, you're just as good as your last sequence or effect or joke or whatever, but you want to be leading to something inevitable. You're just figuring this out now? That's my response to this whole thing when I read this. I'm like, you've been making movies forever and TV series, a whole bunch of things. And and a lot of it's been and a lot of it's been good. But you're just figuring this out now. Are you freaking kidding me? I mean, first of all, before I go off on this too much, you can't put this all on him. Okay, he wasn't even supposed to come back for Rise of Skywalker. Let's remember that in this new trilogy that Colin Trevorrow was supposed to be the driving force behind this final movie okay so it's not like he was supposed to it's not like he was ever supposed to come back jj was but at the same time how do you not know that you have to have a plan look at freaking marvel studios look at marvel studios who plans things out what seems like five plus years in advance and look how that's working out for them not necessarily working out for others i get that but look at what they've done partially because They've planned things out. They know where they're going. And I've criticized them for that sometimes, saying that that can also be to their detriment because if, if there's a monkey wrench in the plan or if, you know, one of the movies bombs or one of the characters doesn't quite work out, then you, you might be stuck a little bit, right? And I think J.J. kind of touches on that in, in these quotes that I, that, I was, that I was reading to you. But at the same time, having no plan, which that's one of the, that was one of the criticisms, right, of this latest trilogy was that there was no real concise direction of where things were going. And it didn't seem like there was much of a plan. Well, guess what? It, it, maybe this confirms that. And whose fault is that? Is that JJ's? Is that, is that Kathleen Kennedy? We want to blame her for something else now. Is that Lucasfilm? Is that just Disney in general? Who is responsible for this lack of planning? And he talks about, you know, you have to Deal with the unexpected, right? And maybe the unexpected is coming back for another movie. He said the unexpected can come in all sorts of forms, like having to come back for a movie that you didn't think you were coming back for. But at the same time, right, you get to take the ball and run with it, especially since it's not like he was coming in cold. He did the first movie. He set the whole thing in motion. Now, just because he didn't think he was coming back doesn't mean he shouldn't have understood where he wanted to go. Now, again, you pass that off to somebody else's vision. It's going to be a little bit different. But at the same time, how did he not know from Force Awakens where he would have gone in Rise of Skywalker? You had to know where you were going to go before you even stepped foot on that set. You had to have you have to have an end game. You know you're getting a trilogy. It would be different if this was another property and you go, you know what? Here you go. You're going to walk in here. We're going to try this out and maybe we'll do sequels. Yeah, maybe. You know right off the bat you're getting a trilogy. That thing should have been 
planned to a T, no matter who was directing it, from start to finish. You should have known where you were going from start to finish. Now, again, sometimes that original plan, you get on set, and, and JJ talked about that too. You get on the set, and you know sometimes you, you see so, you know somebody's killing it, we got to have them in, in there more. Or somebody's not killing it, we got to have them in there less, and so on. But ultimately, your big point, you've got to know where you're going. And, and I say this as somebody that actually enjoyed this trilogy. And, and, and full well knowing you're never ever again in Star Wars going to touch that original trilogy, ever. That was almost the perfect trilogy, and they're never going to reach that pinnacle again. I'm sorry, they're just never going to. But you could still make good Star Wars content. That's been proven, okay? That has been proven recently. So it's not like it can't be done. But the fact that this was said and brought to light now drives me berserk because what it tells me is is that something so simple could have given us something so much more special and so much better, and we didn't get that opportunity. And part of that, absolutely 100%, is on J.J. Abrams. And as somebody whose work I enjoy and really respect, I got to tell you, finding this out and hearing this really, really kind of puts a little bit of a damper on that for me. So, you know, I'm going to go find myself. And my J.J. Abrams fandom now and see where and see where this goes, because I've loved a lot of things that J.J. did, and I'm looking forward to a lot of things that J.J. has coming up. But this is something that in his future projects now, I'm definitely going to be keeping in the back of my mind. Speaking of switching things up, looks like from the CW upfronts, we got some very interesting news. One of the first things being that the Powerpuff Girls live action pilot is going to be reshot and reworked. According to CW CEO Mike Pedowitz during a conference call with reporters, He said that what he saw was too campy and not rooted in reality. I'll get to that in a second. And maybe it was a bit too adult, too, by the way. There was supposedly the script that was leaked, and there was some, you know, funky stuff in there that might not have worked. But, you know, they said they believe in Chloe Bennett, Dove Cameron, and Yana Peralta, who were were in the cast. They believe in Greg Berlanti and company. They believe in Warner Brothers, and that's why they want to give this another shot. Cool, but rooted in reality, it's Powerpuff Girls, okay? It's Powerpuff. It's not going to be that rooted in reality. Not everything necessarily needs to be rooted in reality. You're going to reimagine them as older, bitter, you know, people who lost their childhood. I get that. You got to let that go off the rails a little bit. I'm sorry. And, and, and The Boys is one of the perfect examples of that for Amazon. Sometimes you just got to let things go off the rails. And The Boys is incredibly well done for how they do that by the way. So sometimes rooting something in reality isn't always something that you need to do. That's just my comments on that. Also, the fact that the painkiller Black Lightning Black Lightning spinoff was not picked up. Little surprised about that, actually. Jordan Calloway is a, a star in the making. You could have got him, you know, for almost nothing to do this painkiller series. And now you're moving on from that, especially after a wonderful, wonderful conclusion to the Black Lightning series. I love what they did. In that finale. The other thing that kind of set off alarm bells for me was the Flash season eight is going to start out with a five episode event that's going to feature several Arrowverse characters in a crossover like feel. Not only that, but most of the DC shows, including the the series premiere of Naomi, have been pushed to mid season. Now, I don't get too bogged down in ratings news. The ratings for Arrowverse series have been down almost across the board. And it makes me wonder what is the future? of the Arrowverse on the CW. It's got me worried a little bit, to be honest. And, and feeling like you need to do this with The Flash, that, that sets off alarm bells to me because The Flash is supposed to be that flagship series now, right? That's supposed to be the big series that's basically carrying things on the CW, and it almost seems like there's a little bit of a lack of faith in that, for lack of a better way of putting it, quite frankly. So I, I don't know. I'm a little worried about where things are going in the Arrowverse on the CW. I mean, I'm not saying that that you should be worried about like Supergirl ending and things like that and Black Lightning ending. You know, sometimes stories just conclude. Okay. And maybe, and I think that for both of those series, it was their time to conclude. Although I thought Painkiller was super intriguing and they should have done that. You got to at least give it a season, even like a shortened season, like Stargirl, give it 10, 13 episodes and see where it goes. And if it doesn't work out, what you're out, you know, 10 episodes of one season, you're, you're adding a day of programming too. 
They're, they're actually adding more program. They're going to be seven days a week now of their programming. And devoting a night to game shows is maybe not something that you necessarily need to do. And I love game shows. So I don't, I don't know why you couldn't at least have found a spot for this. It, that just, it just seems weird. So I'm a little concerned about where the Arrowverse is going. And, and you know, th- I think things definitely do need to change up a little bit. But this is something to definitely keep our eye on as we head in to the new TV season. Really quickly, I want to touch on a couple of big trailers that came out this week. Marvel's Eternals, which of course is going to be in theaters on November the 5th. That trailer finally got here. And, you know, honestly, unless you're an Eternals fan and you know what's going on, a little funky, right? A little out there. You really, you really, maybe you're not sure what you're seeing, what you're looking at. But what you basically have here, if you look at the synopsis, is a story that spans thousands of years. It's going to feature a group of immortal heroes forced out of the shadows to reunite against mankind's oldest enemy, the Deviants, which that is straight from the synopsis. But, we, you know, you get to see everybody. You get to see Richard Madden as Icarus. You get to see Gemma Chan as Circe. You get to see Angelina Jolie as Thena. Not necessarily everybody in action, by the way. It's a good cast. It seems like it's going to be a very intriguing story. You know, the, the these immortal heroes finally intervening after all of these years and seeing, you know, how they go throughout this timeline. And you see how they're going to they're going to go through several different timelines here or span thousands of years. I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing, but I do think that people are, might go in expecting a Marvel Studios movie. And this doesn't have the Marvel Studios feel, but maybe that's the point. Right. Again, after Endgame, you got to do things a little differently. You got to shake things up. And what's wrong with that? What's wrong with doing a movie? Like Eternals, it's a little bit different and maybe a little bit out there. I actually like that they're taking this risk, and I commend Marvel Studios for taking this risk. I'm intrigued. I do think it's their riskiest movie yet, but I think it's one of those, you know, it's either going to pay off big or it's going to or it's going to be a huge disaster. It's going to be one or the other. But if it pays off big, that's going to allow them to take more chances. So I'm very interested to see how the general public responds to a movie like Eternals and see where that goes. A movie that's kind of flying under the radar that I want to make sure you know about is False Positive on Hulu. It's going to be streaming on Hulu on June the 25th. You've got Alana Glazer and John Lee who did the script and directed. Yeah, they did Broad City together. You're thinking it's comedy, right? Not a comedy. It's a it's a creepy thriller that's going to star Alana Glazer as well as Lucy and her and her husband, Justin Thro, who plays Adrian. You know, they have infertility issues and they're trying to get pregnant. So who do you go see? You go see the best infertility doctor that you can, Dr. Hindu, who is played by the Pierce Brosnan. And then you see that it's I love the way they did the trailer because it's this this happy. Yeah, we're having a baby kind of feel. And then the the music changes and that's when things start to get sinister and weird. Right. And you see that some crazy things going on. and, And you have to wonder, as you see this trailer, is Lucy crazy or is she not? And that's something that we're going to have to figure out. As we go through the movie on June the 25th, I'll definitely be covering this more in the coming weeks. So make sure you keep your eye out for interviews and stuff like that. Really quickly, I want to touch on the Sandman casting that happened from Netflix this week. And I want to look at a couple of names in particular. We've got to talk about death, right? That's the casting news that we've been waiting for. And we now know, I told you that we we're going to mention her earlier. Kirby Howell Baptiste is going to be playing death in this movie. As a matter of fact, Neil Gaiman actually gave a little blurbs about each character and he said that they saw hundreds of women and none of them were right they wanted someone who could speak the truth to dream on one hand but on one hand but also you a person you'd want to meet when your life was done on the other and when they saw kirby howell baptiste's audition they knew they had their death so i mean that's the freaking creator right there neil gaiman telling you that so if you if you're not sure about this casting this is the guy who better who would know better if they have the right person for the job than the guy who created the freaking freaking series in the first place, Neil Gaiman. I trust Neil. Here's a very here's a, the other very interesting one for me, and that is that they've cast Joanna Constantine. Yes, John Constantine's great 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 grandmother, but now bringing this character into the present time, and they said and Neil Gaiman was saying. When they tried that, the script was sparkier, feistier, and in some ways, even more fun. So, while I will certainly miss John Constantine, I think doing this is a bold and very cool choice. And a nice way to throw a wrench and change up the story 
a little bit, which which is something you ultimately want to be done in any adaptation, right? Do you want to see the shot for shot, or do you want to see things changed up a bit? And that is exactly what they're doing here. Jenna Coleman is going to be playing Joanna Constantine, and Neil Gaiman says that she's tough, brilliant, tricky, haunted, and probably doomed as this character. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what she brings to the table. If you want to see the full cast, go to the, go to our website, Down and Nerdy Podcast. Dot com. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Down and Nerdy Podcast. Again, thank you so much to the amazing Meadow Williams and Swen Tremel for joining me to talk about American Trader, The Trial of Axis Sally, which you can see in theaters and on demand right now. Again, also thanks to our sponsor this week, HelloFresh. You want to get those 12 free meals, go to HelloFresh.com slash Nerdy12. Use the code NERDY12 to get those 12 free meals. Always follow us along on social media at Down and Nerdy 757 on Twitter and Instagram and at Down and Nerdy on Facebook and online, like I said, at Down and Nerdy Podcast.com. Remember, you never have to apologize for being a nerd, so let your fan flag fly and be good to your fellow nerds. <laughs>